thank you uh, very much to Jeff for uh, hosting the meeting for us. Um, we only have a few licenses, so we wanted to make sure we get this out there. We did have some uh, questions and concerns um, locally, and you, you may have seen it, of course, across the state and across the nation. And we understand that as a department, we're not always immune to um, beliefs of either uh, bias through the police or through different trainings. So we want to make sure that we sat down and so that we can either answer any questions you may have or we can get into um, different trainings that the officers go through. Even though we are a small town, uh, the officers are still held to a much higher standard for training. So whether you're a city officer uh, of a larger city or a larger town or a small town like ours or the neighboring towns that we have, uh, to be a police officer in Massachusetts, you have to meet those requirements and you have to attend training. And um, just because we may not have the call volume that Springfield has, we still have to attend the same amount of training to maintain our status as a police officer. Whether we're a brand new police officer or you've been an officer for over 20 years, there's a minimum standard that you have to uh, continue. Um, the agency that goes forward and actually issues that is the Municipal Police Training Committee. And the, uh, it's an acronym is MPTC. The MPTC comes up with topics of annual training that the officers have to attend to include the chief of police, uh, especially if that chief um, works on the street. If they're uh, a chief that has no police powers, uh, then they wouldn't be held to that regard. But um, almost all of the cities and towns have a chief of police that uh, follows the same standard. So with that, the MPTC puts out, well, the committee puts out uh, a guideline of what training has to be done every year for that officer to maintain their status as a police officer within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, each department has a policy and procedures manual and each department makes sure that the officers will continue to follow those policies, will be updated when those policies are updated and the officers agree to them and sign off on them that they understand it, that the, that the policy has been changed or has been updated. Even if it's something as simple as, you know, changing the acronyms of different agencies. Um, you go through that and make sure that every officer understands that. As far as the certifications, the officers have to go through different types of trainings. Um, everybody always understands that um, the most common are uh, when a police officer graduates from the academy, either in the academy or during their training procedures within that town, they will get their certifications for conducting radar, so speed enforcement. They'll also get certifications or the authority to carry a firearm. Um, most departments, if not almost all of them, require a license to carry uh, to possess or carry that firearm, not just because they have a badge on the shirt. They still have to follow the same standards as a regular citizen would have to follow. Uh, on top of that, the officers will go through firearms training every year, um, any less, less than lethal training that they may have, whether it be uh, to recertify with either pepper spray or what they call the electronic control weapon. Everyone knows them as tasers. Uh, they also have simulated impact weapons. Some departments have uh, bean bags. Some departments have pepper balls. Um, it, it all depends on that department. Um, and then after that, the officers have other different topics that the MPTC puts out for trainings. Uh, this year in May, the MPTC put out um, a few of the staples that, the, that they do every year. Uh, one of them being legal updates. Legal updates is because the law is always changing and the law is always fluid, the officers have to get updated on a lot of the, the changes in the laws. Um, so the officers have to attend uh, legal updates classes, uh, defensive tactics classes. So that discusses how to work within uh, a understanding of what amount of force can be used, if any, uh, the different stages, if you will, of what the use of force would allow. Uh, this year, they also talked about the health and wellness 
going to talk about the implicit bias, uh, domestic terrorism, and um, responding to COVID-19 because we were inundated with that as of March. So that was this year's setup for trainings. There's also a local option. So some departments will send some officers to either a specialized training or recertification for different events or different trainings that are more uh, related to that agency or the type of call volume that it may receive. Um, so from going, going forward from there, every officer has to attend those trainings and get the certifications, whether they be through the MPTC or an authorized vendor. Um, so I've been lucky enough to be employed here since August of 2016. So for the past four years, I can tell you that our officers have been uh, continuing right along since even before I got here with their trainings. They continue with their certifications from firearms to legal updates to um, all the other topics that have come up throughout the years. And uh, they're very, I can speak on behalf of the officers here, they're very motivated and willing to work within the community on offering the best police force or the best policing that as the citizen would want. Um, if you want a certain type of law enforcement, uh, it's usually seen when the officers will interact with the public and they're always willing to work with individuals across town government and across um, the community uh, as, as a whole. Um, so putting that out there, I just wanted to put that in the beginning. I know that um, I did speak with uh, a member of, your, of the group that sent out a request for information regarding some of the um, ideas to have the police department show that they're either following these, uh, I believe it was um, these eight requirements. Uh, and we can either go over those now, or if you wanna start doing questions throughout, please, you know, uh, I can talk a dog off a meat wagon, so I don't wanna sit here and bore you all with just words. Um, I wanna be able to listen to you and, and interact with you as well. So if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Okay. Um, I guess not seeing- uh, my, my first question would be, what is the length of this meeting that you're planning for? Because I don't think we knew that. Um, I have no time limit. Uh, this is a oh. <laughs> uh, event. Um, so uh, unless some of you have to drop off, like I said before, I can keep talking. So. If any of you saw my interview four years ago, I talked about an hour and a half. So, uh, Lou? Hello. Is Lou Vincent? Um, I have a couple questions. Okay. Just sort of, I, my understanding, talking to different town, um, I'm in Deerfield, uh, I've been talking to Deerfield people and just sort of... I'm sorry, can anybody else hear her? Sort of trying to develop an understanding of what math policing is about. And it seems like there's... Um, you know, it's different town to town. It's different how much funding you have for the different trainings, different how, which training builds to town to town. So it's not like there's a unit. I'm sorry, Lou. It's very choppy and I can't. Yeah, Lou, you're breaking up. I think yeah, you I lost it for a second. Yeah. Yeah, and if I could just add a, a couple things. One is um, if you are having trouble maybe trying to shut the video off, it might improve the connection. And I'll also note that for, for people on a computer, at least, I think um, on a smartphone, if you're having trouble connecting, there is a chat function. Um, and Chief, I don't know if you have it, access to it or if you want, I can read the questions through the chat to you. Um, I don't know if you're, you're on a phone and if that's easily accessible, but um, yeah, that, that was a difficult connection for me too. Okay. Yeah, uh, if you have a chat and you want to type it in, that's fine. But if you want to speak, 
uh, and the connection is good, we'll, be, we'll all be able to hear you. Okay, well, I, was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the Sunderland Police Force has faced and the types of um, police actions that are typical for the department, especially within, let's say, the last year or two. Um, just sure. giving us a better sense of really what's yeah. happening on the ground. No, most definitely. Um, so um, I, I know a lot of people will, will wonder, you know, a town of this size, what do you really uh, interact with? Um, and my boilerplate answer is usually, you know, uh, regardless of jurisdiction, you will always deal with some type of call that every other department deals with, whether it be a, a larger city like Springfield or a smaller town like ours or, or a neighboring town, just not with the amount as those towns deal with. Uh, I can tell you that in the 20 plus years that I've been on, um, uh, I've only had, uh, I've only had to assist in one murder investigation. And I was perfectly fine with that. Um, those are for the bigger cities. You know, a lot of people who try to go to a smaller town like the family interaction. Um, when a police officer in Sunderland, for example, you know, we have over 3,600 people who live in town. Uh, the motoring public is where we may see a lot of interaction. So we have a lot of rentals. We have a lot of homeowners. Uh, we, we're a farming community. So we may not see, or I can tell you, we definitely don't see uh, the call volume or the high intensity volumes of uh, murders or rapes or things of that nature. Um, do we deal with um, some of the investigations? Most definitely. Uh, we may have to assist in an investigation because it either went through our town or uh, a victim or a suspect of a crime was in our town. Um, but the day-to-day -day operations or the day-to-day -day call volume that we would have range anywhere from uh, the, probably the most uh, called in complaint is motor vehicle traffic. Uh, and that's encompassing of everything, whether it be the sheer volume of cars, the speed of motor vehicles, um, and the way in which people are operating their vehicles. People will call in because somebody is passing somebody uh, or passing a bunch of cars to somebody's uh, driving on the wrong side of the road or things of that nature. So we have a large uh, motor vehicle complaint contingent, if you will. We don't have a motor vehicle traffic enforcement division. We're a much small, too, too, we're much too small of a community to have that. So the officers would try to be out on the streets to be seen in public as a way to prevent um, or reduce the speeding, whether it be through the school zone or down 116 uh, or any of the back roads that we have. So that's the, the, the major one. That also includes car accidents. You know, We have maybe 100 or so car accidents a year that has gone up every year, um, but the average is about 95 to 105 accidents a year. Not a lot uh, in the grand scheme of things, but um, when you're involved in the accident, that is the most important thing going on in your life at that moment. Uh, we also interact with the public um, because we're part of our training is through uh, the medical side, so the first responders. So we work well with the fire department and with the uh, regional ambulance service. So a lot of times, a lot of you may see us uh, showing up to an ambulance call. Somebody calls in for trouble breathing or whatever it is, we would show up because we're in town and we're available to be there. And then the ambulance shows up almost immediately and we're able to assist them if needed. And if not, we can back off and then they will would continue that way. Um, the next level or the next type of call that we probably have a lot of is some type of, and this is very broad, a disturbance. And the disturbance could stem from either loud noises, um, noise complaints in general, whether it be arguing um, or noise disturbances regarding um, music or parties. Uh, and then the most egregious would be uh, those of a domestic situation. So somebody is in an assault of uh, uh, condition and then they contact us because they're a victim 
or a neighbor calls us because it sounds like uh, a disturbance going on and we respond to those. So those are the, the three top that we really deal with. And I'm being very broad about those, but motor vehicle, um, and then the medical, and then um, the disturbance, uh, disturbances in general. So those are the top three that we have. Uh, we have policies in place for things that we may never have to deal with. Um, uh, bank alarms, we may have a bank alarm. When would the bank be held up? Um, and say that the, the, the bank in town was, was held up uh, a few times, um, but I think the last time was five or six years ago. Um, so you have a policy set up for that type of call and how to interact or how to respond, um, but you may never in your years of working here ever have to deal with that. Um, Susan? Um, my question at this point is, um, if you get a call for a domestic issue, are you, um, I probably watch too much TV, but are you required to knock on the door and be admitted when, instead of like going in with one of those things that slam the door in. open? <laughs> yeah, battering. <laughs> um, so in most cases, I well over 90% of the time, um, we're either met outside or we're met as we come up to the door and we're knocking. Um, well over 90%, we're, we're, we're interacting with somebody in the family or someone in the home or somebody in the complex uh, because they've come out to get assistance from us. Very rarely do we, you know, surprise, if you will, quote unquote, um, if they're being loud or there is a domestic situation and we respond to that, most of the time it's, it's, the, it's the victim calling or someone in the family calling for that victim. If we show up because say it's a residential, you know, whether it be an apartment building or it be a duplex uh, and the neighbors call, uh, in those small instances we have shown up, but knocking on the door, um, making ourselves known, uh, usually gets it an answer right away. Um, I can say, I think one time, by my memory, I think one time in the past 12 months where we had to continuously bang on the door and the person on the other side was yelling at us, telling us that they weren't letting us in. In that situation, you'd have to determine whether or not somebody's life was at risk for you to force entry. Um, if, as you explain why you're there, again, most of the time, people will then respond and open the door to confirm that you are, in fact, a police officer and to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and it, it could be a whole myriad of different reasons why there was loud noises coming from there. Um, we've had quite a few situations where it was um, the neighbor heard loud noises and they thought it was yelling and screaming and it ended up being somebody had their TV on extremely loud and it was a movie and there was no one else in the, in the house or no one else in the apartment. And there were other times where it was in fact a domestic and the officers had to uh, arrest the uh, aggressor um, for that situation. So it's, it's a myriad of different things. Yeah. Well, you may remember that the Sunderland Dems met with you actually when you were pretty new. So it's probably two years ago. And uh, we were meeting with you because it was early on in the president's policies about ICE picking up immigrants and uh, whether the Sunderland police would be um, asking people for, uh, for example, in a, in a vehicle stop, whether they would ask them for their identification to identify them as perhaps an undocumented immigrant. And you said that in general, you were not going to be going out into the fields to talk about people that were brought here to work in the summer times and during stops, you were not asking for um, identification for citizenship. So we're in a kind of a different place now. And I'm wondering if that's changed at all for Sunderland. No, when, when dealing with a motor vehicle stop, the officers, especially say it's the operator of the car, they're simply following mass general law and mass law requires that the person operating the motor vehicle has a license, whether that license is from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Kentucky, or Greece. As long as they have a license, they're allowed to drive on the public ways of Massachusetts. Um, the only license that is not viewed as being authorized uh, is what they call an international license. That's not an actual license. If you live in Greece and you're visiting, 
you would have your license from Greece. And that would warrant you or give you the ability to drive on, on a public way in Massachusetts. If, um, if my cousin came down from New Hampshire and was driving in Sunderland and he, he got stopped, he would be asked for his license because he's the operator of the motor vehicle. Um, if he produced his New Hampshire license, okay. That's where they go by. They go by the, when, when they ask for identification, it's pursuant to national law regarding, are you duly licensed in the state or the country that you live in to then allow you to be uh, an operator here in the state? And so that's that only for the driver. For the driver. The only time they would come up with the, with the passengers, um, there's a whole list of things that they would have to come up with. So if a passenger was requested for a license, it would be if that person was appeared to be over 16 and wasn't wearing a seatbelt, then they were going to be issued a ticket. They try to identify them for the ticket. Uh, if the driver was arrested or the driver didn't have a license and he couldn't drive and was given a criminal complaint, then they would ask the passengers to then go forward and see who had a license there, who then could take the vehicle over and continue driving. Um, they don't go through the car to determine, you know, who's in the vehicle uh, and what type of status they are. They, they don't do that. Um, I think the only other time we've gone forward to ask uh, about all the occupants in the car is if it's a motor vehicle accident. Motor vehicle accidents, we have to articulate in our police report who else was in the vehicle. And just like the operator of that car, they too have to do the same thing when they fill out their paperwork uh, to file a motor vehicle accident. So you know, it's not our intent. And like I told you back then, we're not federal agents. We work under the powers of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts within the jurisdiction of Sunderland. And Sunderland doesn't have any bylaws that restrict um, non-residents from being in town. So there's no way to enforce any of that for us. Thank you. Sure. Lou. I'm gonna try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, okay so it's kind of a, a tri-faceted maybe question here. Um, I guess my, the first part is, is I'm developing an understanding that there isn't like a uniform requirement, um, or maybe I'm wrong, for um, what trainings are gonna happen. Like from town to town, that is different. And it could depend on what funding a town has, what choices a town wants to make. But from town to town, the trainings that happen for the police department may be different. They may not even go to the same training on the same topic. They could potentially choose different trainings. So I guess one of the questions I would have is, um, how, how can we know that our officers in our local towns are receiving, you know, which one, what kind of training they're receiving and does it, you know, how much does it exceed the minimum or which trainings are they receiving? Like for instance, if town officers are taking a bias training are they going to a two hour long thing on a Saturday and then that's it, they've met their requirement or are they doing a six week bias training where they get an in-depth understanding of bias? Like how are we, how do we know that? Because, and that kind of leads into my second question, um, with the predominance of stops being like traffic stops, uh, motor vehicle stops, I think it's probably like, in my mind, likely that some vehicles that are older model, late model cars may be stopped more frequently. It may have, there may be an economic class bias there embedded in that, like saying this car may not be, you know, um, economically in the same space as an upper middle class white driver. It might be in an economic sort of scenario where it would be more likely to be a poor person or potentially a poor person of color and you know like kind of just like how are we watching that officers aren't using bias in the first place when they stop and then what's happening when they do stop like how are they what tools are they given to check their own bias as far as um, what's happening at a traffic stop well so this year, uh, you can look up on the mass.gov website and under the MPTC, they list this year's um, committee approved topics that they have for the training year, or what they call in-service training. Those trainings are for every officer in the Commonwealth. Uh, these are the minimums that they have to apply, they have to attend. Um, 
in, in you talked about implicit bias that is listed on this year's topics. It is only listed as a half a day training. Um, I think that the, the issue that I've seen, uh, the town I used to work for was a slightly larger than Sunderland, uh, uh, than, than, than obviously now. Um, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the issues that may have come up in a, a smaller budgeted town is was the department able to budget enough to pay the officers to attend and some of the towns who are all part-time officers to attend the chief may not have a budget that's big enough to pay for all of the officers to attend but it's understood that for that person male or female they have to attend that training regardless of being paid so if you have 40 hour requirement that you have to attend per year to continue your status as a police officer you have to attend that or you will not continue to be a police officer. I mean, that and, seems to me like that's a setup for, um, you know, just a space of like, um, one, that's not equitable for poorer officers who maybe have to pay for that. Maybe they have a family. Maybe that's, it's just not equitable to begin with. And then it might set up an arrangement where they feel, um, you know, like upset to have to go. Like they're having to pay for a training that maybe they don't want to be at, which might then, you know, bias them further against what the bias trainings are, and they may not be participating with them in from a wholesome space, as little as they are. I mean, I, for, you know, a two hour training, if they're just going and blowing it off, that would be really upsetting, but I know it could happen, you know? Sure. I, I can understand that. The, the officers that they attend their training, um, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for, for many years. Um, even back when I was required to, to attend the training where I wouldn't be able to get paid, um, the trainings that are offered by the Commonwealth are not for any money. You attend these trainings. Yeah, you have to, let's say, for instance, we have a, a handful of part-time officers. Part-time officers are held to the same high regard as far as training that they have to attend. So their full-time job could be whatever. And they would have to take a day out of their work to attend this training. If not, they're not being paid by the department. Well, let's hope that they can get a paid day off uh, from their full-time job to attend this. Uh, the trainings that are offered, whether they're um, remote, and a lot of them have become remote since COVID, but a lot of them were in uh, the in-service classes where they're held at the academies. So if you couldn't attend one of the classes at say Springfield Academy, you could travel to the Boylston Academy or another academy to attend that training. Or the MPTC allows for uh, remote training venues. Uh, we've been lucky enough to utilize the uh, um, the Montague Police Department. They will go through and host different trainings up there, uh, and we also imposed a uh, like a regional Franklin County regional training, where a lot of the officers could attend training at um, GCC. And, and they, we try to do it at different times. So if a person works full time during the day, they might be able to attend an evening class. Um, but it's a certificate, it's a requirement for the officers to attend, uh, and they have all year to do that. So they don't, they don't put all their eggs in one basket and try to get it all done in July. We put them through a series of, um, available months, uh, throughout the year that they would be able to attend and complete those trainings. And then those trainings are then reinforced by the supervisors in each department, making sure that the officers are following policies. Uh, reviewing case reports all the time, reviewing citations, and uh, seeing uh, the types of stops that the, the officer has. And the, they would then in turn either discuss or have a sit down with that officer if there was some type of, if it appeared that an officer was only stopping, you know, late early 2000 sedans and not stopping, you know, um, uh, uh, newer vehicles. Um, but going forward from there, the officers, uh, we all would work with each other, but mostly the supervisory staff would have the opportunity to review uh, the logs of every day for the officers. And then, like I said, review all of the police reports. And, and I'm generalizing, but it's more than just that. You know, we have to file uh, reports uh, what, what I call the UCR reports, the Uniform Crime Reports with the federal government. And we do that on a monthly basis. 
and all of our reports are reviewed and submitted to the state, which then get downloaded to the federal government. So the UCR reports, the Uniform Crime Reports, um, show uh, on one side of it, the types of calls that we have. So if we have, um, I don't wanna just throw out a number, but if we have a few thousand calls a year um, and we have a, a couple of hundred reports that are submitted, those reports are uh, show a different type of status as what you may see if I was at a budget hearing. I've, I've sat with finance and told them these are the, the amount of calls that we had. But even though we have thousands of calls, not all of them require a police report. So you know, a medical call doesn't require a police report unless, um, unless something bad happened, uh, whether the person died or someone got injured during the call, things of that nature. A police report would, would stem anywhere from a no crime incident. So somebody called to speak to an officer to update them about uh, suspicious persons in the area. And they may, may file a police report and they may file a written statement within the log to show that they responded. And then you have some of the other cases where um, somebody was hurt, somebody was uh, attacked, uh, a crime was committed, things of that nature, then a police report would go from there. Written citations or even verbal citations, it's documented in the log. And in the documentation, you can see the types of stops that the officers are doing, whether they're male operators or female operators, um, the times of the day, the types of vehicles and the reasons for uh, the stop. And then did the officer cite that person or only issue a verbal warning or was a, there a, a, a criminal summons attached because um, the, the reason for the stop stemmed more than just speeding. Say they stopped them for um, the registration was suspended. So they could, the law said they could not drive the vehicle on a public way. They were stopped for that. And then were they given a written civil citation or were they given a written uh, criminal citation, which is in effect a summons to appear in court so they can then explain to the judge. So there's a, there's a whole list of things that the supervisors would have to go for. Is, yep. um, so how would a person's racial or ethnic um, status be documented in a situation like that? Is it only documented that it's a man or a woman or is it, say, or is it documented as far as ethnicity and race? So on the citation form itself, uh, there's a spot for gender and a spot for race. Um, most recently, they, they passed a, um, a law within, within the, um, the state house where they were trying to do um, the cell phone, stopping for cell phone use. And they also added the um, racial information that's in there. So they wanted us to then in, indicate whether they were uh, male or female or non-binary and then what their race was. Um, and a lot of times the request that came from, I believe the, the Chiefs Association was more along the lines of, well, why are we not asking the people to self um, report when they get their license? Because they're asking the officer when they approach the car that based on the information that they believe that they see right then and there, that they're supposed to then say, okay, well, that's a man, or that's a woman, or, that's a non-binary gender, or that's a white or, or black or Hispanic or Asian. And they were trying to get the legislature to um, have the individual self-report instead of making it an officer requirement, mm -hmm. because yeah. I, I'll be honest that's with you, I've been doing this for 20 years, I could screw that up. Uh, I could walk up to them and say, you know, good afternoon, sir. I stopped you for speeding. And the person looks at me and says, I'm not a man. I'm a woman. Well, that's bad for me because I, I've now listed them as a, the wrong gender, even just in the beginning of the conversation. I haven't even put pen to paper yet. Um, yeah. That's I mean, why I'm trying to get that how done. How can an officer make that determination? They can't say, you know, I know this person is black or Latino or, or, or man or woman like that. That seems like a, a really weird gray zone that probably needs some more attention somehow. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, okay. And that's well above me. 
So I have a follow-up uh, yes. question, if I may. Um, actually, three parts. The first, oh, by the way, uh, my name is Jay Bowderman, and this is my <laughs> wife Kirsten's Zoom account. That's why the name says Kirsten Lindblom. Um, so uh, going along with what Lou said, how is the, the support you're getting from the town, is it sufficient to cover the trainings and to, you know, make it easier for the police officers to get the training? And is, has it been difficult to do that? And then the second part of the question is, I understand that in the legislature now, there's at least two bills, one in the House, and one in the Senate that are going to up the requirements, as I understand it, for police officers and certification eventually throughout the state. And when that happens, do you foresee that you're going to need more resources from the town? Because one of my concerns, why I'm here tonight, one of the concerns is that you get enough support from the town in terms of um, community involvement, but also in terms of financial resources. Sure. Well, to start off, the, the support, as you called it, um, just in general from the town has been overwhelming. This town is a very close knit, very supportive town and it's it's enjoyed by the entire staff here as far as um, budgetary. So the, the support has been there budgetarily from the town. We've gone to them and say, these are the minimum requirements that we have and we need to then send those officers to training full-time or part-time. And this is the cost that is associated with that. And the town has never taken that away. Um, they would obviously want us to want me specifically to keep an eye on, on making sure that we do not go over that budget because we all have to work within that, that line item, which is perfectly fine. Uh, so the town has not been difficult in guaranteeing the funding or, or giving us the resources monetarily wise to send the officers to that training uh, every year. Uh, like I said, from firearms to domestic terrorism to officer health and uh, wellness, legal updates, things of that nature. So every officer attends that and, and completes that. Um, to go one step further, the MPTC, MPTC saw that there was a lot of academy and training classes canceled due to COVID this past fiscal year. Mm -hmm. The fiscal year ended June 30th. So the MPTC took it upon themselves to work with and partner with agencies that could provide training throughout the Commonwealth and was able to do a lot of distance learning, which was at no charge to each individual officer or department, which is great. The only difference or the only, the only issue I think that maybe a resident would have is, okay, so at one point, say we have two officers on duty, could one of those officers sit in the station to do um, some of the requirements? Most definitely. As a resident of town, as a taxpayer, you may be okay with that, or you may be upset with that. You may be saying, well, wait, we're paying them to sit at the station and not patrol my street. And some residents would say, well, no, I want an officer to be certified. So we have to find that happy medium to go through. Um, on top of all that, uh, Mass Chiefs of Police Association in, in, within Massachusetts um, was successful in working with um, the legislature in getting the $2 surcharge that was passed a little while back that was imposed on uh, rental cars. So the belief was with the amount of rental cars that we have in the Commonwealth, if they added on a $2 surcharge, that $2 would go to the state and they would build a training budget for law enforcement. Um, I don't know specifically if it's just for municipal police departments, you know, towns or cities, um, or if it also included state police, environmental police, court, all of those, any law enforcement um, within the Commonwealth. Uh, that's up, like I said, that's for the state level to decide. All I know is, is once the money is there, they can use that money to offer more classes um, regardless of class size. I know in the past there were some classes that would be heavily attended because the officers could attend it while either on duty or uh, on their off days, but the part-time officers couldn't attend it because it interrupted during their full-time jobs. Uh, so these classes, because the funding was there, 
and it wasn't a tax on, on the regular citizen, um, it was able to, well, the hope is, is it would be able to continue funding the training for police officers across the Commonwealth. And that's something that, you know, was a, what, what you could call a win um, for training because the police departments across the Commonwealth have been working since prior to 2015 on changing in, in, in changing law enforcement trainings um, as say what we did back in the 80s and 90s. And we've been continuously working on offering and getting police officers training to continue um, because nobody wants a police officer to graduate the academy in 1995 and never have to go to training ever again. Uh, the law changes month to month and yeah. things change all the time. So the officers should be able to understand uh, uh, some of the laws as they change, whether they go through uh, Supreme uh, Supreme Courts or regular uh, court cases that happened uh, that changed the, the way the law was written and understood. So mm -hmm. policing has changed tremendously and the town has been supportive uh, from whether it be residents or through the budgets. And we've been able to have the officers continue that training. Thank you. Thank you. Susan. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question and maybe others have questions. Um, we got copies uh, by way of Jeff and Aaron of the um, updated use of force policy. Yep. And thank you for that. It's good to see in writing what the, what the policies are. Um, the first one is about um, choke holds and strangle holds. And yep. it says, it says that, um, uh, they're prohibited unless the situation warrants their use. Yeah, so chokeholds and training holds have not been a technique that has been part of the defensive tactics curriculum, the, the, the training curriculum uh, that's been authorized by the MPTC. Well, I've been my, my question really is, how frequently is any kind of force needed in Sunderland when there are arrests for whatever reason? Well, so if and strangle an officer, holds and chokeholds in particular. Well, yeah, I mean, chokeholds have not been part of our use of force setup, anyways. Uh, like I said, Massachusetts has not been training officers to do that. Um, the only reason why that's in there is because if the officer's life is in jeopardy, and that's the last resort for them to do that, that that's where the allowance is. But it's not taught. This is how you do it. It's not explained um, this is the process and how you do this. The, the defensive tactics curriculum that is taught in the MPTC and then is then disseminated throughout all the agencies, they go through type of, uh, the type of force that is um, commensurate to the force that's being produced to you. If I show up on a scene, I'm a short man. You know, I'm five foot seven. I say I'm five seven and a half. My daughter says I'm five seven because she's taller. Than me. Um, but I'm not a man of, of of a great stature. So just my physical appearance in uniform is already a level of force. It's your physical appearance. You're in uniform, and then you you go up from there, if need be. Sometimes you never have to go up. Just you being present would either calm somebody or might diffuse the situation. Then you have verbal tactics. You know you're giving commands. Um, and then there's light touch. So say you're going to assist somebody um, away from, um, say you have a suspect and a victim, you want to you want to distance them. And you may have, if you ask the person to move and they don't move, you may assist them. You don't, you know, beat them. You don't hit them. You don't knock them to the ground. Um, the officers work with uh, the people on the scene to determine what the next level uh, is from there. Um, whether the person sees you show up and you try to de-escalate the situation uh, using de-escalation that you learned either through the recruit academy or in-service trainings throughout the years. Uh, you, it's not your intent to walk in and then cause everybody to get upset and start yelling and screaming. Your intent is to walk in, to talk to the people, try to figure out what happened. Um, as, as I remember from, from many years ago, uh, when, you go to, when you go to a situation, you have 
this person say, you have this person say, and then what probably actually happened um, in the middle. Um, so the officers go and they, they'll talk to people, they'll, they'll deal with the situation, um, hopefully in a very calm and uh, um, easily understood manner and go from there. I haven't, before I get to that. So if officers have to use a level of force that is beyond say normal handcuffing, so say somebody broke into a house and we show up and we see that they're there and we arrest them. If they didn't fight us, if they didn't jump on top of us, if they didn't, if they listened to us, you know, saying, you know, we're at a, we're at a scene, we're telling them to stop, uh, stop police, they stop, we tell them to put their hands behind their back, they do that, and we place handcuffs on them to tell them we're either going to detain them or they're under arrest, depending on the situation. And nothing stems from that. That's the basic level of force. If the person tries to fight you, punch you, kick you, spit on you, um, whatever the situation is, and you have to use a level of force, let's say you have to then bring them down to the ground to put their hands behind the back. Well, now that's called a use of force report. You have to file that report to, uh, to your supervisor to explain why you did that. Um, if I have to draw my taser um, a situation that I had a couple of years ago here, um, we got to a house and a man had a knife and I took my taser out and ordered him to drop the knife. He dropped the knife. He came downstairs. I put the, I, I put the taser back in the holster. I didn't turn it on. I didn't point it at him. I didn't tase him. I didn't activate the, 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 the probes. Um, but that's still a requirement. I still have to now file that use of force. That shows that this situation happened this is my reporting of it and why it happened that way. And um, I even went as far as writing up how many use of force reports that we had in the last, uh, since 2017. Um, and just to give you an idea, since 2017, up until yesterday, we only had nine reports filed. Um, in 2017, we had, um, that's the one I just told you about with the knife. That was 2017. Um, the, the taser was not used. The, the person heard my command, saw me in uniform, maybe even saw the taser coming out of the holster. I yelled at him to drop the knife, to which he did, and he complied at that point on. But that level was a use of force report. They, I had to file a use of force report. Yeah. Um, and then to go with that, with, uh, with uh, the tasers, we have to file a use of force reporting for the, uh, the ECW reporting, the electronic control weapons. There's a database with the state that we submit. It used to be a couple times a year, and I believe just recently it was changed to once a year, which, which is fine. It just means I have to have all my documentation so at the end of the year, I can put all of those on there and forward that to the state so then they can review it. Before we could even have tasers, we had to go, in any, any agency in the Commonwealth, had to go through a use of, I'm sorry, a policy on, on the electronic control weapons and submit that to the state for a review by the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security. Once that was then reviewed and authorized, we could then implement that policy in the department and then we could order the tasers, have them here, have the officers go through that training and then actually carry them. Um, we, we only have 11 officers, uh, but 10 of them are certified in ECW, ECWs. One of them is not. Um, well, he is just not um, the, the taser that we carry now. Uh, he was certified in the old taser that we had. Uh, so until he gets certified in the new one, he can't carry it. Um, so we make sure that that is, is part of the use of force continuum. We show that the officers report use of force um, that's above and beyond what they... Because um, uh, the policy says that people have to be trained in any of these weapons or they can't yeah. carry them. Yeah. So, you know, and, and if you look at the policy, there was one spot down there where it talked about uh, simulated impact weapons. Um, a lot of people commonly refer to them as beanbag weapons. Um, those are uh, $5 
projectiles that are deployed from a shotgun, that shotgun uh, is only used for that purpose and not for lethal rounds. Um, we don't have those yet. Um, the only reason why we would potentially get those is for if we have a suspect outside of a 20 foot range and beyond because the tasers um, effectively can be used from a 20 foot range and in. Um, you don't really want to, well, you don't, not that you don't really want to, you shouldn't be using the impact weapons at a close range. That could break the skin, that could cause a lot of injuries far greater than what the intended purpose was. Um, the other devices that we have on our belts are pepper spray. You can't carry that unless you've gone through uh, pepper spray training. And then we have baton. Um, I know plenty of officers who would rather use or um, who think it's it's better to use a taser than a baton because a baton is is a large impact weapon. Um, in most cases, a steel rod, and they don't believe that a, a, a baton is something that it, it causes more damage than they would they would ever want to impose on anybody. Um, I. I've used my baton to break car windows because of a car accident, you know, more than I've ever used it for anything else. Are they wood or metal? No, they're metal. I mean, they were, might've been wood way back when, but they're metal. They're, you know, metal, it's like steel rods. Um, but they're, they're tools on a tool belt, basically. Um, and you have them at your disposal if the situation requires it. Um, I can go to a, I can't, win, I can't go to a noise disturbance and talk to somebody about, you know, playing their radio too loud and he tells me to go pound sand, I can't go whack him with a baton. That's inappropriate, that's wrong, and that's not allowed. So you have to use other techniques, reasoning, de-escalation, try to speak to them as a human being and not uh, someone where you demand compliance. That's not the intent of having these on your belt. Um, and, and, and you also shouldn't go from talking to somebody and then right up to lethal force. Lethal force is only there if that person is uh, giving that same type of force back at you. So a greater amount of force to you. You're not, you're not going above them. You know, if that person's, you know, sitting that there with, with their, their hands in the air ready to fight you, you don't take your gun out and shoot them. That's not That's good. proper. Right. That's not what the police department's trained in the, in the Commonwealth you follow along with the trainings that you get year in and year out to make sure that what you're giving to the um the public is something that they want you don't give a you don't give the town of sunderland a um militarized police force if that's not what they want if they want police officers that can talk to the kids at the elementary school, to the high school, to the senior center, the guys and girls at the senior center, or just somebody mowing their lawn, you know, they still have to be available to you to help protect life and liberty. But they also don't want to be walking down the streets arm in arm, um, demanding that you comply to, you know, some type of order that was passed. You know what I'm saying? Lou? Um, I just... One of the things that you know I'm I'm poignantly aware of in my own house because I have children of color and I'm really acutely aware of how um, extra sensitive our community of color people of color are right now towards the police. Um, so what I'm wondering is how is the Sunderland Police Force even informally working with how to approach people of color, like at a traffic stop or in, in any situation where uh, people of color could be more dysregulated than other people right now. And that is not with any intent to be harmful to the police or anyone else, but just that there's an element of fear right now, especially in relationship to the police. The police present a fearful presence to people of color right now. And so therefore there's naturally a higher level of anxiety which is in a lot of cases gonna present as maybe some in abnormal behavior to police officers. They might consider it to be you know, challenging behavior when in fact it's just a dysregulated, very scared person who's being confronted by a police officer who holds a weapon or has a baton or whatever it is. You know? So I, my question is like, 
how within Sunderland Police Force are you looking at this particular issue of how to approach our community, our citizens of color with sensitivity right now? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to apply that to, like you said, a motor vehicle stop or, or when you stop to, to deal with a call and, and you have a group of people to, to speak with. The officers, uh, and, and I can speak for this department, um, and I know a lot of police officers across the state, but police officers in this department are not going around and demanding something from somebody just because of their gender or their color of their skin. The officers are reacting to, you know, they get, they get called to a, a, a complaint or they get, they stop a motor vehicle. Um, and, you know, where we understand that there's a heightened, um, a heightened issue with law enforcement across the country. Um, so the officers are the officers are trying to take a cautious uh, a step forward. You have to you have to see that every motor vehicle stop that we have, we don't know who's in the car. So whether it be my mom to my daughter to one of my friends to whatever, you don't know the the person that you're inter interacting with. And the same thing goes when you're behind the wheel of the car, you don't know the law enforcement officer that you're dealing with. But I can tell you that across the Commonwealth, not, not just in Sunderland, but across the Commonwealth, officers are, are still continuing to do their job and are trying to show, and it's difficult with masks on, but trying to show that we're not a disgruntled police force going forward and demanding compliance to regulations or laws. The officers are trying to interact with the public uh, in a very positive light. From so I've had officers playing basketball with some of the kids to just stopping on the side of the road to talk to people. Um, and I know that's only a small tidbit of what's, you know, what's going on, but the officers are, are you know, dealing with what they have on scene, how they're trying to assess everything all at once, and then interacting with people regardless of race or gender. It, it, it doesn't reflect, I'm not gonna change the way I do my job if the person's, uh, 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 depending on what their race is or what their gender is, I'm still going I guess, to- yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess I feel like, you know, within your department, are you able to talk amongst yourself and say, hey, you know what? People of color right now are scared out of their wits to confront police officers right now. If you stop a person of color, they might be terrified. Like, is there like a, just like an open conversation about how you're approaching this as a unit, you know, like making sure that people are openly talking about, we're not being racist, we're being anti-racist, we're being really clear about protecting people of color and making sure they're not in this heightened state of fear around our police force. Like, sure. is that something you're considering or doing or how are you approaching that? Yeah, no, we are having conversations, uh, whether it be at shift change or throughout the day, dealing with some of the officers. Um, uh, I, I would be very hard pressed if I was, you know, if I was sat down and, and asked to, to list any officers that I thought were racist uh, in my entire career. Um, I, I know that working with the officers here, um, Yes, it's it's on the minds of, of of all the officers of whether or not the the public perceives us as uh, uh, individuals who are uh, racist or are biased in some way. Uh, but overall, the officers are discussing just maintaining safety for everybody and safety for themselves, and making sure that the um, that they're following the law and following the policy. Um, but yeah, we do sit down and, 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 and talk about some of the calls of the day that we may have dealt with and, and try to go over, you know, well, why did it go that way? Why do we think it went that way? Um, and sometimes that could be from, yeah, sometimes that could be from um, um, because somebody had a different uh, uh, idea of who we were or what we did, or they came to us and, and later on explained to us, Hey, I'm sorry. I might have been kind of mouthy to you, but you know, I used to live in whatever city, and uh, I never got along with the police there, no matter what their color was. Uh, and then they they express that they've had a, a positive interaction with us. But you know, the officers aren't actively going out 
in dealing with people because of race or gender. They're dealing with if the cause that are given to them. If additional bias and equity trainings could be provided to you through funding, would you want to explore that? Oh, most definitely. My, and my officers here um, are, are, are willing to, to work with the, the community uh, and follow along uh, like a lot of uh, police officers across the state, you know, um, they believe in a, a post type system, the, the post system uh, for the peace officer standards and trainings. Um, that's been put out there and that's been discussed for quite a long time. I know that the previous director of the MPTC was trying to get that done. Um, I want to say for at least eight years um, or around then. Uh, so I know it's been there and I know that showing that officers are held, held to a higher standard and are going forward and attending trainings that they should have, that as a community or as a state, we say we should have officers going through these trainings. Yeah, I believe, and I know that my officers and officers across the Commonwealth uh, believe in that as well. A question, uh, in light of the uh, COVID-19 and the college students coming back, is there a restriction on the number of people allowed to gather either indoors or outdoors? And how will this be enforced? And secondly, is the wearing of masks in public going to be enforced in Sunderland? All right, great question. So um, I know the governor put out the, um, the memorandums in, in the state of emergency regarding uh, meetings. I know a lot of schools are looking at trying to do a, let's say a reduced setup. So everyone's always heard about the six foot rule. You stay six feet away, you try to maintain social distancing and going forward from there. I know a lot of schools are trying to go with the three foot rule because they're trying to get more people inside. Um, so as long as the governor's uh, recommendation or the information that was put online mm -hmm. regarding what um, what the social distancing aspect is. Um, we don't have anything in Sunderland that would be an indoor venue other than the school. So the school and the school committee will sit down and go over and figure out um, how they'll place kids and teachers into that environment and they'll work with the Board of Health in getting that done. Uh, as far places, as, I'm sorry, some places nationwide, they're, they're talking about groups of 10 or fewer, and it could include a, like a private residence, a party or, or something like that. Well, I mean, I, I know as, as recently that the Select Board and the Board of Health has granted the Police Department the, assistant, the ability to assist them on enforcing some of the uh, Border health violations, you know, the mask wearing and the uh, social distancing. Um, but we're not going into homes making sure that you don't have 10 people or more in there. Um, it, not at all. Um, as far as being outside, I, I'd have to look at it on the, uh, the governor's uh, declaration, but I thought that as long as you were outside with social distancing, you were allowed to have. Um, <coughs> more than 10 people. And what about masks? So, so masks, they have those, uh, they have the different variances as if, if you, uh, if you can't wear it. If you're outside, if I'm going for a, a, an evening stroll with my, my teenage daughter, um, and we uh, come upon a group of people and there's no way to get around them, do I have to put a mask on before I get past them and then take the mask back off? Um, that, that's, who knows? Uh, the, the question for, do you have to wear a mask outside? You only have to wear a mask if you're going into, I think, private businesses. A lot of them are requiring it before you can come in because they're, they're going to refuse service for coming in. Um, and if that person refuses, then the only thing that I think that person can ask them is, you know, well, why aren't you wearing it if they say that I have a medical condition or, or, they give a reason, it's up to that, say, private vendor to then contact the Board of Health to say that this person's violating it. Or on the same side, you as a citizen decide to go to um, 
a store and when you're in the store or you're in the pizza place or you're in Duncan's or whatever and the employees aren't wearing a mask, you then could also call in to report that as well. Mm -hmm. um, what we try to do, and the officers all fully understand this and agree with it, that if we get called to that situation, it's more about education than enforcement. We'd rather just say, hey, listen, you know, this is an establishment. They don't want you in here unless you have a mask. Um, or, hey, you're an employee inside of a private establishment, and you guys have to follow Board of Health regulations to keep the doors open. Um, maybe this is what you should be doing. And 99.9% .9 of the time, that's how it goes. That 0.1%, maybe you'll have somebody who says, no, I refuse to wear a mask. Um, but we haven't dealt with that yet. We've been very lucky. Kim? Hey, I just want to circle back a little bit to what Lou was asking a few <laughs> minutes ago. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is you, you have not um, seen any incidents of overt racial bias from the, your police officers. Um, I'm wondering if you have any record or you can talk anything about any charges of racial, racial bias that have come to the police or if there have been incidents of hate crimes um, in our community. And then lastly, if you have you thought, has your department thought anything about reaching out to our community to reassure them that this is who you are and that you are taking steps to make sure that things don't escalate or that we're not provoking any racial um, incidents? Sure. Um... I can remember, like I said, I've been here for almost four years, and I can, I believe, sometime after July of 2017 was when we had our, that I, since I've been here, since we had our first uh, hate crime um, offense, if you will. Uh, there was a, a person that was charged with a crime that uh, met the requirements under the hate crime statute. And we notified the courthouse of that and they continued with the prosecution of that person for the offense and then for the hate crime. Um, and then shortly thereafter, maybe within nine months of that, there was another one. Um, but those are the only two. So I'd say late 2017 and then maybe early 2018. Those are the only two that I've seen. Um, and I review almost every report that comes in. Uh, along with my sergeant, but we review all the reports that come in, and uh, those are the only two that come to mind um, regarding hate crime. Um, when dealing with the situation or going to a call and trying to figure out what happened, um, there has been some times where people will say to us, well, I think they did this to me, or I think that they were doing this because they don't like that I'm a female, or they don't like that I'm a male or they don't like um, my, my gender, but we weren't able to determine that it was racially motivated or gender motivated. Um, but those two specific ones, I know that we uh, filed uh, paperwork in the courthouse um, to go forward with charges. One of which I know um, did time in jail, but I don't know the, the duration. Um, and you said regarding reaching out to the public. Um, we're always open to doing something with the public. We haven't gone out and overtly expressed that because a very large majority of the dealings with the public, because uh, a lot of it's the residents, have, have been very positive. And it hasn't, it hasn't shown us that we needed to do that because we're, we have such a great rapport with um, the citizens in town and we haven't had the need to go forward and. and blast that out there and say, you know, we're here to do this for you and we want to make sure that you know that we're being, you know, upfront and we're following with the regulations for trainings and things of that nature. Um, I think that if, if it looked like it was starting to decline, we would probably do that. Um, but we're always willing, like tonight, we're always willing to have a sit down and discuss and, and be open dialogue about anything that we can, that we can discuss because, you know, we are your police department. And without you, we wouldn't be here. Uh, and, and it's more than just funding. Without you physically here, we wouldn't be here either. So, 
Thank Susan. you for that reassurance. Yeah, definitely. Susan. Uh, just a follow-up question to what Kim was just talking about. Um, is there a any kind of written statement on uh, racial bias or anti-racism uh, within the within the Sunderland police? Um, and is this use of force policy going to be on the town website? So two questions there for you. Uh, well, I don't know about the town website. Um, that would probably have to be a question for the select board because they're my boss. Do you think that um, that would be a good idea for it to be publicly posted? A lot of police departments have that almost exact copy uh, within the Commonwealth. So I don't see why it would be an issue. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't express any trade secrets or, you know, how we respond to things. So it's not a public records issue. Um, so I don't see why that would be an issue. Um, but if the select board wanted to post that, then I'd be 100% supportive of that. So, uh, but do you have a written policy of anti-racism within the Sunderland police? Well, so there, there's policies in regards to uh, rules and regulations. You know, officers can't hang out where organized crime is known to be. Officers can't interact with um, uh, members of hate groups and, and, and things of that nature. But, um, you know, every day or, or, or whenever stuff like this would come up, uh, chiefs of departments will work with uh, the the pillars of the community or the area police chiefs or like the one we just put out with the superintendent. Uh, we all signed on between Jeff and myself and then the, the neighboring towns, their town administrators and their police chiefs uh, to include the principals and the, the, the school committee and the superintendent because that's the community we deal with. We deal with our residents, a lot of them have kids in the schools uh, or work for the schools. And we wanted to make sure we put that out there. And, and that's one of the statements that we did put out uh, from the department heads. Uh, I'm hoping I answer that. I didn't really get that. <laughs> so we put out a, uh, a statement from the superintendent or the superintendent put it out and we all- uh, A statement of what? So it, it talked about the, um, how we perceived what happened uh, to Mr. Floyd and how we admonished what had happened with that police department and how those officers handled themselves in a horrible situation. And, and we wanted to confirm, I'm sorry, affirm the, the, the public that we were, you know, working with um, the residents in all of our communities in, in showing that we, uh, we believe that what happened there was not was not a good thing at all. So that was that was ri a written policy or that was it, put it out? Was just, it was just a statement put out by the department heads and the superintendent. The, uh, I'm sorry, with the school? I didn't understand who you were saying that happened with. Yeah, the, the superintendent of the schools and the uh, local police department chiefs and the town administrators signed on to that as a joint statement. And is that the Frontier School District? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, Frontier and Union 38. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the other things that they, that the, the group had also asked about were um, requiring de-escalation. And I, I started to allude to that, that the officers are required to learn de-escalation uh, techniques during their MPTC training, whether it be at the academy or um, additional de-escalation tactics um, and trainings throughout the annual in surface uh, as required. So the officers do go through that. Um, I can't remember the last time it was part of the staples in the MPTC, but that was gone through. Uh, the other one was require warning before shooting. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we explained that consistent with the uh, standards that were put in place from um, Graham versus Connor and Ten Tennessee versus Garner. Those two cases um, uh, happened quite a long time ago. And they kind of set the ground rules as to how uh, an officer's attempt to use the lowest level of force in order to, uh, in order to effectuate a lawful objective. Um, 
and would attempt to warn individuals prior to using any use of force. Um, whether the um, officer had to use the taser um, or they had to order that person to drop a weapon, things of that nature. So there's requiring that type of verbal commands um, to the person. Um, there may be, however, in some instances, <clears throat> excuse me, there may be, however, some instances um, where it's impossible for the officers to actually provide that warning. Um, I probably couldn't give you a, a, an example, but, um, well, no, I could give you an example. Uh, they might not be able to give that warning if their actions needed to prevent the loss of human life. If they had to do that immediately, then they would not be able to then go forward and uh, give that warning. But it, it doesn't go from zero to 60 uh, usually. There's usually a, a, a process before you get there. Um, the other one they had asked about was requiring um, the exhaustion of all alternatives before shooting. That's when I talked to you about earlier about the tools on the tool belt. You know, you showing up in person and you have um, your visual appearance, then you have the verbal commands from there, and then going forward from there, <clears throat> you would give um, warnings for the next level, whether it's, you know, say you had to deploy the taser, you would then uh, verbalize to the person to drop the weapon before, you know, you might get tased. So drop the weapon or you'll be tased, things of that nature. So you require it. So it's basically the same as uh, require a warning before shooting. Um, you would try to give a, a, a verbal command before you got to that level. Um, the next topic they brought up was banning shooting at moving vehicles. I've been in law enforcement. I started my training in 96. Um, so the, in those years, I've never seen it allowed in Massachusetts. Um, so they're not permitted to shoot at a moving vehicle, except in a very limited circumstance. Um, which again, goes back to those two cases, Graham versus Connor and Tennessee versus uh, Garner. Um, it would be so the officer had the requirement to defend their life or the life of somebody else. Um, and then when we go through firearms training, we also try to, you know, not that we ever, it's difficult. You know, we, we can't train at shooting cars. Um, we don't have a bunch of cars to shoot at, uh, at the gun range. Uh, nor do we have the desire to shoot at cars, you know, as a training tech technique down the street. That's just something that's unheard of. Um, there are simulations that you can go through. Um, they have different types of training venues where you could attend to do, um, like a computer screen and they're very reactive. Uh, I took part in one a few years back where uh, this department had a grant and they were able to get this training uh, set up and it was a air piston um, simulated handgun that worked with the computer, uh, laser guided on the screen. Um, and to me that thought that was absolutely amazing and then I see kids, you know, on their video games who probably have a better program that they practice on at home. Um, but it doesn't give you the same types of um, reactions. And uh, the really good programs that they have in law enforcement enables the officers to give commands, verbal commands, and then later um, or during that setup, it would actually change to uh, a different uh uh, uh, reaction from that person. So, so you guys, do you guys ever do any training around knees on the neck and that what happened with George, is that ever something no. that you guys have discussed or used? No, they don't, they don't train, they don't show that as part of defensive tactics. Defensive tactics for the MPTC would get into how to safely handcuff somebody so you're not hurting yourself or them. Uh, and 
they get into the areas of the body that are not um, the areas of the body are broken up into different uh, levels. So, you know, the head, face, and neck and groin area would be um, life or death situations. So, you know, we're not going to uh, use a taser on someone's face. You're not going to use a baton on someone's head or groin because you could cause some serious harm, injury, or death to them. Um, a baton would be used on arms and legs because it's a gross motor ability to, to swing um, and those are the you're hitting the arms because they have a weapon or you're trying to have them stop attacking you or somebody else um, we've never gone through any type of training where they show you you know you put your boot in someone's head or, some, or someone's neck where you place your knee to hold them down that's never been part of training uh, that I've ever seen in Massachusetts has been um, on the forefront for training uh, for many years uh, and is seen by a lot of states as uh, a, 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 the state or a state that is is continuously trying to be ahead of the game in, in, in trying to show their officers, this is what we do. We don't go forward and 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 and, and do chokeholds or place your knees on the necks uh, of people. You're you're trying to defend yourself, but you're trying to put that person into custody with as little harm as possible. You're not looking at causing pain, um, so much pain that they've got, you know, a broken windpipe or a busted eye socket or things of that nature. You're, you're trying to just put them in handcuffs. Um, so, and, and that kind of goes with uh, number seven that the group had sent out, requiring the use of force continuum. Um, there are I couldn't even tell you how many. There are so many different use of force ideas across the world um, that some of them will make, make your head spin. Um, if this, then this, and then if, after that, then this. But if this happens, you have to go to here. It, it, you need to make it easier that, okay, if you interact with somebody and they're yelling at you, you, you as an officer don't escalate it to firearms you only use your firearm because that's the level of force that's being presented to you. Someone is attacking you with a knife or someone is attacking with a gun. Someone's attacking you with a deadly weapon, a grenade, whatever it may be. Um, but someone coming at you with their fist does not raise the level of force to deadly force. Unless, like I said, you're on the ground as an officer having your head smashed into the pavement. Well, that's, the weapon, the weapon is pavement. And you need to try to get yourself out of that situation. Otherwise you're going to die. That time. Well, um, thank you. I mean, I yeah. think I came to this meeting wanting to be reassured sure. from you that incidents like what we're see, what we saw in Minneapolis and other cities were, is not going to happen here to the best of our abilities. Most definitely. And it, and it sounds like what you're telling us is Massachusetts is a little more, um, uh, I don't know, aware of not escalating things like that. And they've put a lot of laws and policies in place. And it sounds like you guys really try to follow them to the best of your ability. Most definitely. I'm going to jump in here because we're about an hour and a half into the meeting and I know the chief said he can talk all night, but I just wanted to get an idea of how many more questions there were. Um, I, I'm not trying to cut off the conversation whatsoever, but just, just sort of a, a time check in and, and see how people are going. Okay. Let's see one. All right. I will keep going. I just wanted to get an idea. Thank you. Why, why don't you uh, go he, oh, first, Lou? Oh, thanks. Um, are you okay? I'll, I'll try to be quick. I've talked a lot. Um, I, I did some research into the Graham versus Connor and looking at, you know, how we're judging uh, what, to, what level of force is used, when force is used, and it's um, largely left to the officer's discretion what is reasonable. So I think like for me, looking at that, having more regulations in place, like this is what happens if you do this or that actually makes sense, not only to protect the civilian in the situation, 
but also to protect the officer in the situation by giving them like really clear guidelines of knowing I can never go past this level that it would be unreasonable to go there or, you know, like having a, like a formula that gave clear guidelines on that very ambiguous kind of statement of what an officer determines reasonable in the moment might help protect everyone a little bit more. And, and like, you know, like Graham versus Connor, that was, you know, I think that's like 30 years old or more, you know? Yeah. So what about maybe updating some of those so that there's more protections in place for civilians and for officers? Sure. No, that I, I can understand where you're coming from. Graham versus Connor, I believe was 1984. And um, a lot of the courts have gone back to that to determine reasonableness and determine um, did the officer act, the officer at the scene, did they act in a way that was appropriate or not appropriate? And then going forward from there, if they determined that the officer was acting inappropriate, regardless of what they determined was reasonable, the court determined it was not. And then they were not following the guidelines set forth on policies or that's been shown to us with the law. We wanna make sure that, like I said before, the law is always changing, but even though the law is always changing, the one case that a lot of the courts have gone back to is are those two, Graham versus Connor and Tennessee versus Gunner. And that gives them a good baseline to, to judge the officer's uh, actions uh, against a case like that. So oh, to, to make it a change, Tennessee, you have to- Tennessee versus what? Garner, G-A-R-N-E-R. Thank you. Yep. Um, so to, to change that, it would have to come obviously above my pay grade. It would have to come from the legislature and go forward with, this is how we're going to change things. Um, and then working with the Municipal Police Training Committee in determining at that point, um, what types of trainings they can offer to the individual police officers across the Commonwealth to then be commensurate with the law. Well, so they, just you know, like, you know, at the time that a lot of these laws were and policies were formed, we, we were looking at a different construction of what the legislative space looked like, what the court space looked like. Now, hopefully we're moving into a space where more people of color are represented in these spaces, have voices of authority in these spaces, really needs to be reevaluated because the laws were created in a very like kind of white supremacist place and a very different you know era in our collective thinking mm -hmm. and in which we we're still subject to but i think there is there needs to be a new awareness of understanding the inequities that were pleasant that were present during that lawmaking time and remaking them now with a more equitable sure. lens. Well, and I understand that, but the only reason why I keep bringing up, say, Graham versus Connor, that law, you know, that, that case was heard back in the 80s. And then since then, with different laws coming into place and different cases coming before the courts, they've gone back to that one to say, hey, this is how things happened in this situation. And it was a good baseline to review whether or not an officer's um, uh, actions were reasonable based upon the totality of the circumstances. Um, instead of saying, you know, I come in on a Monday morning to, to see what the officers did on a weekend um, and uh, review the case. And I sit down with them and say, well, well, why didn't you do this, this, and this? I can do that. I'm their supervisor and we can go through that. But I also have to put myself in the place of where they were at that time because me sitting in front of my computer on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. is different than being at the actual scene trying to determine what was going through that person's mind, what information they had at that time. And that's the only reason why I bring it up is because the, the, the courts throughout the past 30 years have looked back at that and said, you know, based upon what went on back then, the same holds true today where you have to judge the actions of the individuals based upon what they were going through at that time. And, and like I said, they could determine that the officer's actions were not reasonable, or they could determine that the officer's actions were reasonable. But I can understand that maybe we can go forward on a broader spectrum and see what, what we can do from the Commonwealth's perspective, uh, which would then trickle down to the agencies. 
just as a point of clarification, my understanding of uh, like um, the two cases, uh, Graham versus Connor, especially, that was decided by the Supreme Court. And then from that, I believe they develop these practices and they go back to it because that's the standard that everything is going to be judged on in terms of was it okay or not okay at that moment for that police officer or to act the way he did whether it's right or wrong but that that's the that's the interpretation of the law and i think that's that's why they keep going back to it but um and yeah they haven't had a case at the supreme court that would make them change the standards the minimum standards right uh, and, and, that's and, what, and that's not saying it'll never happen because right. like i said before the law is fluid and is always changing right yeah so um my question if there was nobody else that had another one um the group the human rights commission working group that sent the original letter to request about the use of force policy um just one of the things that um, I'm part of that, and one of the things I learned in the the last year or so that we have been uh, together and working on these kinds of topics is that um, it's it's not a matter of whether somebody's racist or not racist. It's a matter of a continuum, and we, being white and being male, there are certain privileges that I don't even think about every day because they've always been there and that's been the normal. And the reason I bring it up is because it was a big surprise to me when we re read this book, White Fragility, together. And I started to realize that the way I thought things were for in the world in terms of like, you know, races getting to along and stuff like that it it, it is totally um what i uh, turned on its head and it was very difficult for me and thus the title of the book was uh, you know white fragility why it's hard for white people to talk about racism or race and the thing where i'm going with this is that um when uh, lou and other people have brought up sort of subtleties about police stops and the age of the car and all these other things part of what i became aware of is that these subtleties are in there and you're not you're not and in any way especially if there's a you know a confrontation you're not aware of it at all and you don't even see it unless you've opened the door at least once by reading, say, the book or like talking about it for months. And so what I'm what I'm asking is, I mean, you seem like you are very interested in different kind of training for the police. If we were to be able to say, get the funding or get a grant or get an opportunity for the police to say, do some kind of training on this very subtle racist, racial bias stuff. Um, and I don't know what the programs are that they go through or how they in, what are involved. Um, would that be something that you would be open to and, and welcoming and you think that would be received well by the officers? I personally am uh, welcoming of that uh, 100%. And I believe that the, the, the people that I work with are fully supportive of that too and would be willing to attend those, whether they be in person or uh, in this type of uh, venue. Um, I think that would be very well received. Okay, thank you. No, definitely. I want to back you up on everything you said, <clears throat> Jay. I thought it was great. It's true. It's all true. Okay. Great. All right. Um, do we have any other questions? Emily. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so I'm a parent of a going to eighth grade at Frontier and I'm in the Deerfield Inclusion Group. And um, we were talking about um, citizen oversight committees for police departments and um, we weren't 
exactly sure if there were any in Western Massachusetts. I kind of did a quick search and it seems like there aren't many. It's no. only like Springfield, Pittsfield for Western Massachusetts and then a couple Cambridge and somewhere else out east. Um, do you know anything about these citizen oversight committees for police departments and is it something that you could see happening in some, any of the smaller towns? Oh, I know definitely it would work in a smaller town. Uh, the town I was chief in prior to this, uh, I grew up in as a child. Um, I can tell you that my mother was part of the Civilian Law Enforcement Review Advisory Board. So um, I, I knew that she was part of it and I know other people were part of it. Uh, when I was on the police department, I knew that they met monthly. I don't know what they did when, I, when they met because I was just a police officer. Uh, when I became chief in 2006, uh, I did meet with them, um, not a lot, but I did meet with them. Um, and their status was, and again, this is a town of 5,500 people, um, or about 5,000 people, depending on what census you take. Um, and their, if I remember correctly, because it's been a few years since I've been there, their mission statement, if you will, was to review and evaluate any complaints against a police officer. If they want, if a civilian wanted to file with that group, uh, or if a complaint for a police officer comes in to the police chief, the police chief could then forward that uh, complaint to that committee, or for them the results of the investigation that was, was completed. And then they would review it and then they would offer um, their insight on how they think it should be handled or what should go from there. Um, it lost some traction, um, mostly because the, the committee members moved down to Florida um, and the younger community didn't want to take part in it. Um, and I don't know if it's still in existence, but I know 2011, 12, maybe is the last time I, I basically dealt with them. Um, and like I said, I've been here since 2016. So I know it can be done in some of the communities. You just have to figure out what, in, what interaction they're gonna have with the police department or with the town administrator or with the select board. What level of authority do they have on determining um, the type of um, how do I want to say this? Um, so basically the select board are the ones that determine whether or not, you know, based upon the information given by the chief, the select board can determine whether or not that person is going to be reappointed or not. So that officer um, gets a reappointment every year. Uh, if that officer um, is let go, the selectman would remove the appointment and that person is no longer a police officer in the town. They do have some towns that have that type of group to determine whether or not um, they have the authority to go forward with enacting some type of discipline. Um, I don't believe I've seen that. I think it's been that they give a uh, their belief to the selectman and the selectman review it and then they take their guidance and decide if they're gonna go forward with that way. Um, so it all, it all depends. Uh, it doesn't have to be a city like Springfield. It can happen in a small town. Uh, you just have to get a lot of buy-in. You have to be able to get the, the public that wants to be a part of it and want to enact some type of civilian review board or, or whatever you wanna call it. And then, then you have to decide what kind of authority you wanna give it. Um, is it allowable based on mass general law or is it not? Uh, like I said, in, in towns, they usually get the authority from the selectmen or the selectmen have the authority to remove an officer. Um, but I don't, I don't know of any committees that have the ability to remove an employee. So that would have to be uh, something that would be agreed upon. So like I said, you have to have buy-in, you have to have a, a group of individuals who wanna meet regularly and not just be appointed and four years later, they say, wait, I'm part of a committee? They should be meeting regularly. They should be able to go over and review uh, any complaints that come in or review any, um, any issues that may come up within the police department. Or they could have a broader scope and not just look at it for police, they could look at it for 
um, any town employee. Uh, again, personnel bylaws aside, Jeff would probably have to answer that. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, formerly I worked in Amherst and they had a, they have a human rights commission. Um, and I will say that the, the scope of that commission is very broad. Um, they receive complaints. It, it's not limited to the uh, jurisdiction of Amherst. So they receive uh, human rights complaints from around the world. So you want to, you, I just want to echo uh, what the chief said about thinking about it. They also are, are supposed to write a report, but they have no investigatory authority. They're a bunch of volunteers. How are they going to investigate, uh, you know, a claim of a human rights violation? So um, I, I just, I think that, that if that is something that the community is interested in doing, um, these are things that we want to think about. And, and, you know, to the chief's point, uh, how much time volunteers are going to be able to invest in this and um, what, what the scope of complaints that they would receive are and what their authority would be uh, to investigate and then recommend um, certain types of actions or uh, what, what would come of those investigations. So, that's, sorry, Emily, did you want to say any more? No, that, that was helpful. I'm just in the exploratory phases. It's really the first time I've even asked anyone the question. So, so that was great. So what, what I'd like to do at this point, since uh, Jeff, you brought up uh, the Human Rights Commission, um, the, the group, the Human Rights Commission working group is not officially recognized, nor have we asked to be recognized by the selectmen. The working group that I'm talking about, we, we're on the way to sort of getting our act together. Uh, but we do have a mission statement. And I'm, I, uh, I just wanted to, if I, if I may, put that out there so uh, it can show you where we're headed. And it also may address, Emily, uh, a little bit of what you are thinking about or not, not related to complaints, but just more education and support. Anyway, this is what we have so far, and here it is. So uh, it's about two paragraphs. The uh, Sunderland Human Rights Commission is committed to ensuring that all residents and visitors feel welcome, accepted, and safe. We believe that dignity, fairness, justice, and respect are human rights regardless of race, with an asterisk, color, national origin, ancestry, gender, sexual orientation, sexual identity, family, marital status, age, source of income, socioeconomic status, religion, ability, genetic information, military status, citizenship status, or legal record. Our mission is to support a community in which everyone's history, cultural heritage, experience, and rights are recognized and honored, and where no one is marginalized or a victim of discrimination. The commission will help our community grow by providing opportunities for dialogue, education, and the cel celebration of diversity. And the footnote for the race is that we understand that race is a social construct with no basis in biology. And there is only one race, the human race. Our society currently uses the term race for legal purposes. And we look forward to a time when the word race is no longer used to subdivide people. So that's as far as we got on the mission statement, but it might sort of uh, assist in your thoughts. Emily, about uh, the board or what you were thinking about. So that's, that's it. Anybody else? I'm so Hi, this is. Oh, I need hello. to go. Okay. This is. I, um, this is Aaron. I'm calling in from the library. Um, I've been listening into the discussion, and I just have one question to follow up to some of the things that Lou has been asking about. Reading over the, the use of force policy um, in various places, it says that uh, use of force is permissible when and only when the officer feels that his or her life is being threatened or endangered. Now, there are no specific guidelines in the use of 
force policy to to make that determination. So I imagine that's included in the training that officers receive to make that determination when the officer's life is in danger. I wonder if, if um, Eric, you could talk a little bit about that, how those determinations are made, because unfortunately one reads too often that a police officer has made a determination that his or her life was in danger when in fact it was not, when no weapon was possessed by by the person in question. And so I'd like you to, to talk about the training that police officers receive in making those split section split second decisions about when the officer's life is in danger and when it is not. Sure. So, you know, I, I may begin my conversation here by also referring back to the two cases again, Graham versus Connor and Tennessee versus Gunner. Um, the, the officers go through the use of force training in the academy. And then after they uh, complete the academy, they continue with that training uh, throughout every year. And the use of force training touches upon different cases that have happened throughout that year. If something new came up um, and it was uh, relevant to uh, the use of force and how an officer could potentially use that force. Um, use of force has also changed in the 20 plus years that I've been on because, you know, tasers weren't invented back then. Uh, and they were just getting rid of mace and only using pepper spray because mace was a chemical and pepper spray was more natural. Uh, and, and pepper spray would attack the mucous membrane where uh, mace would attack the respiratory problems. And there were too many deaths associated with mace. So the, the training is always training, changing and, and very fluid to go and to conform with the law. Um, in some aspects of use of force, and you can see that on the, in the policy, it gets into definitions regarding uh, the type of individual, whether you have an actively resistant, um, or a compliant individual or uh, aggravated assaultive individual. And that kind of puts in perspective where they are when you're dealing with them. Someone who's just sitting on the sidewalk, refusing to stand up, not, not in the middle of the road, not uh, imposing any type of threat to anybody. Um, that person in their actions does not warrant the officer to escalate and you know become combative with them or use a, a, a deadly force um it gets into something like i mentioned before about the aggravated or assaultive individual that person is 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 trying to harm you to a point where either you um, get severely injured or you die and they'll you know i've watched use of force uh, the, the the model and, and the latter oh if this person does this then you're allowed to do this, but it's always changing. So you never had a good concept of where you needed to be um, back in the nineties. And it's, it's, it's begun to change or I'm sorry, it's not begun. It, it has been changing throughout all of these years to allow an officer to see more fluidly how they're supposed to react. Um, and why I brought up the cases is because um, the officers will sit down and learn and hear and read these cases and read how uh, the, the officers then interacted with somebody and see where they went wrong or where they went right. And we want to continue with showing the officers that as you go forward in your training, um, you will do on the street as you train. So if you train properly and you learn the actual setup on what laws are there, and how you're supposed to continue with it, then you're going to then apply that um, on the street when dealing with the public. So um, the use of force training, uh, a lot of it can be related to any legal updates, any, uh, any law changes throughout the year, and uh, then tying the use of force to the defensive tactics training and learning if things have changed on how you should react in going forward. So it's a mixture of physical training to uh, classroom, sit down, uh, educational training. I, well, your answer, well, that addresses how a police officer determines what he or she is allowed to do. Yeah. But the question I'm still asking is, 
How does the police officer determine whether his or her life is in danger? What are the signs? What actual visual um, signs are necessary in order to make that determination? Sudden movements, um, uh, flight of the uh, person, um, uh, approaching the officer, uh, there's any number of, of uh, possibilities that could lead an officer to believe that this person is now being aggressive. And I would like to know if there are any guidelines, specific guidelines given to the officer as to, to, to help that person make uh, a determination. And the reason I'm asking this question is this is precisely the area where unconscious racial bias could enter into the situation. Sure, sure. Um, well, you know, a lot of the trainings when we go through and, and we determine um, the use of force, the officers would have to articulate to their superiors or to the courts if um, that person had a weapon. Uh, that's usually the most common understanding. That person has a gun, um, whether it's displayed or the drawing in on the officer, that raises the level of force uh, obviously, if that person has a knife, um, again, it's a weapon. If that person has a weapon and they're uh, attacking the officer or coming at the officer with that weapon, I don't mean, you know, uh, an, a person has a, a gun or weapon tucked in their waistband and they're walking to the officer with their hands up or they're walking to the officer with their hands out that the officer can shoot them because he can, he or she can see, um, the weapon. Um, usually when dealing with and what, how an officer believes that their, their life is at risk or their life is in jeopardy or someone else's life is in jeopardy is depending on that, that person, the person they're dealing with, on what level of force they're presenting. So if that person is calm and collective and not uh, displaying that weapon or being assaultive, then there's no reason for that officer's life to be in jeopardy. If after many years of being on the job, you end up talking to people and you can tell by some of their answers or the way they act that they're trying to hide something. Yeah, your level of suspicion may rise, but your level of force does not. Your level of force stays with what is happening at that time. And again, that's why the cases from back in the 80s have been a staple throughout because it's been that standard. So you're saying there's a, a, a crucial distinction between suspicion and reactivity in terms of force. <laughs> well, uh, again, a, a person being, if I'm dealing with somebody and I'm suspicious of their answers, it doesn't mean it's going to raise my level of force. It just makes me start thinking, okay, where is this person going to take this? I'm asking them a question about where they're coming from and um, or why they're at a location because we got a call for someone breaking into a house. Um, you have to react to the person's actions back on you. So if that person is being compliant and talking to you and is not displaying anything that would make you suspect of the fact that they're trying to, to hide something from you and there are no weapons present, then you don't have to worry about uh, that next level. You can just deal with while you're on scene and deal with the information you have. Um, the officer is not going to, like I said, and I have to keep going back to that, they're not going to raise the use of force or raise the level prior to what is being presented to them. They're always gonna to attempt to de-escalate the situation. Um, when dealing with people, it's not like you wanna go from zero to 60, you wanna be able to maintain a happy discussion and everyone feels comfortable going forward. There's no reason for me to display my weapon because there's no weapons being displayed back at me or no life being threatened. Um, the officer themselves would have to articulate as to what brought them to that level of force. Um, so like you said, that there's a lot of different things that come up, whether it be the type of weapon, I'm not, not the type of, the, the type of force that that person's using, do they have a weapon? And um, 
how that officer is dealing with that situation at that moment. Um, I don't believe I can articulate now that, you know, if, if a person has a sledgehammer, this is how you're supposed to react because a reasonable person would believe that a sledgehammer, if used on someone, would hurt or kill them. So that is considered a weapon. But if they're a construction worker on a job and you go to talk to them and they have a hammer in their belt or they're holding a hammer because they're just doing roofing, their actions don't show you that they're assaultive or, or, or combative to you. So even though they have a weapon, you're not going to raise that level. Is that getting to it or no? Yes. No, I, what you're saying is very reassuring, but my concern is that too often police and other areas don't necessarily follow the guidelines that you're discussing now. And that's, that's why I think people of color are very concerned and are fearful of police when they hear reports of these limits not being followed. And uh, they feel that the police are out to target them and get them and not to protect them. And I'm, my concern is that all such thoughts should be banished from the minds of any Sunderland resident. And the question is, how can we get there? How can we reassure people that the police in our area are not going to act like the police that we hear about in various places across the country? Sure. And I, I think that, uh, like I alluded to before, Massachusetts has been on the forefront of trying to change uh, policing. Uh, Massachusetts is one of the states who uh, took upon the information received from President Obama for the 21st century policing and trying to employ uh, enact a lot of those into, into some of the trainings. A lot of the supervisors would get it first so they can then react to the officers when they receive that training. And that's been in place for, for a while in dealing with the types of trainings and how officers are going to react. Um, I think Massachusetts has been basically an example uh, for the country. I'm glad to hear that. I think people need to know about that because I'm not sure many re residents of Massachusetts do know that. We've, we've found that to be the case in the last month or so, yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Well, not seeing any, I just want to let you know that you know, I am here. Uh, I live in town. Uh, I'm a resident along with you. And my, my, my kid goes to the uh, uh, regional school as well. So you'll see me at, you know, a local restaurant or Dunkin' Donuts or uh, out, out on the street or in the station sometimes. Um, we're lucky. We have a, a beautiful town. Uh, and I, uh, I'm busy enough where I'm not always sitting in my office, uh, as can probably be determined by the mess that I have, because uh, I'm out there uh, as much as I can be. Um, we just have that type of town, and a lot of us in the area have that type of town where we can enjoy working with the, the, the community. Um, I truly have a great department that I work with. My coworkers are amazing. I have a great support system with uh, the area chiefs, some of uh, who I've known prior to coming over here, and a great uh, select board and town administrator. Uh, I've been able to now enjoy working with Jeff and before that with Sherry. Um, so. You know, I think we have a great relationship and, you know, if, if you ever have any questions of me, please reach out to me, uh, stop in and see me or call ahead. I'll probably meet you outside because the town buildings aren't open yet. Um, but we're around and, uh, you know, any of the officers would be more than happy to talk to you as well. I just want to say thanks, Eric, and thanks everybody else. This is very nice and very reassuring. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. Thank thanks a lot. Bye-bye.